Let's give the kids a round of applause. They did a great job. Give them a round of applause. They did good. Stuff happened in that short amount of time that they presented there. I think they did a good job. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's recap real quick. They, they went through Palm Sunday, the palms waving in the palm branches, the Last Supper. They went through Jesus' death on the cross and, and he, his body being placed in the tomb. They went through the angels saying that he's no longer here, he's risen, he's come back to life. They went through all of Holy Week in nine minutes. And so today I want to focus in on the first part of what they covered on, on Palm Sunday. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to open up Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, we'll pick up the read in verse 1. If you've got a church Bible, that's on page 801, page 801 in the church Bibles. So Matthew chapter 21. Now Matthew is one of the Gospels. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're all written about the life of Jesus. And so we will read to this morning uh, about when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And as you turn in your Bibles there, I want to give you some background information so we can set this story up just right so we can understand it as best as we possibly can. And I'm going to recap some of the things that the, the students up here said. And I appreciate it. Colt, I think it was Colt who said this. He said, every year at Passover, always in the spring, families come together for the feast. And so we've got Jerusalem, and we've got the people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so there's the, there's the normal crowd of, of people coming to the city. But then there's a, a surge. As I read the story and I put together the pieces, I think there's, there's more than the normal. I think there are people coming out of the woodworks, coming from everywhere, because there's a rumor there's a rumor that the Messiah is here. There's a rumor, there's lots of rumors about Jesus and about what he's done and who he is. See, Jesus has been doing ministry for the last six months in this area. He's going around and, and performing miracles and, and healing and teaching and, and he lays, raised Lazarus from the dead just recently. And so there's, there's a debate, did it really happen? Or oh, is it just a, a made-up story? There's some tension growing because the Sanhedrin are losing power. Jesus has taken over. So the Sanhedrin, they're, they're plotting their own plan. They're going to put Jesus to death, and they're going to re-kill Lazarus, send him back to where he started. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. And so I can see that the, the flood of people coming into Jerusalem is even more than normal because is this really the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for? Who is this Jesus? Let's see who this guy is. And so the people are there, and Jesus is there too. So let's pick up the read. Chapter 21, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the mountain of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And this is interesting that Jesus refers to himself in verse 3 as the Lord. He's starting to be more vocal about who he is, who is Jesus. He says right there, he's the Lord, the, the Christ, the Messiah. And so he sends his disciples to go get the donkey and the colt. And I always thought this was kind of sneaky of Jesus. Like, yes, he's prophetic, and he says, okay, there's a donkey by this house. Go get it. And I thought that he just, like, stole it. He just showed up and just... Take the donkey. But if you remember the background, Jesus has been in ministry for about six months in this area. Three years for the past, you know, three years. So he's pretty popular. A lot of people know him. He's growing a pretty good crowd. And so it's very likely that this person who owns this donkey could have been one of his friends, somebody he's ministered with, or at least they would know who Jesus is. And when the disciples show up and say, hey, the Lord needs this donkey, what a privilege. You know, your donkey gets to be bringing the Messiah into Jerusalem. I don't know if it would be like an advertisement thing, like Jed's donkey farm and send it in. I don't think it was that, but the donkey is going to get to play an important role in this picture. And so they get the donkey, uh, and this is, this is the part that I think is more uh, unique to it. See, Jesus is doing this to fulfill prophecy. Jesus normally walks everywhere. Everywhere he goes, he walks. But he's got this two-mile journey. That's not that far. And he decides to take a, a donkey because he's coming into Jerusalem as the king. If I was going to come into Jerusalem, I'd get a war horse, you know, big horse, lots of guys in armor, big, big entourage, a big to-do, and here I am, the king. But Jesus takes a donkey because I think he's reflecting on Zechariah. Look at verse 4. 
Verse 4 says this, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Verse 5, Say to, the daughter, to his daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is reflecting on Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which reads this. It's up there on the back screen. It reads, Gently, uh, great, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He's reflecting on Zechariah chapter 9, and he says, this is, this is my time. This is what the prophets spoke about. I'm fulfilling it. He acknowledges that he is the Messiah, and he comes in to Jerusalem. And so as he comes in, read verse 6. Here we go. Pick up the read verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Verse 8. And a very large crowd sped, spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the ground. The crowds that f- went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They worshiped their king. And I appreciated what the students said. Again, I'm, I'm going to talk about what they said a lot because they had very important parts in what we're doing today. And so I think, Hannah, I think you said this, Hannah. You said, that happy day when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the crowds pronounced him as their king and sang their praise to him. Let me say it again, because there's, there's something subtle in there, and I want you to catch it. The crowds pronounced him as their king and sang their praise to him. See, I think that, that emphasis on their king, on who they wanted him to be, is, is, is paramount to this. It's incredibly significant. We'll get more into that in a second here. But, but keep in mind, who is this Jesus? Who is this king? That question we'll wrestle with through this scripture. But nevertheless, they, they recognize Jesus as their king, as a king, and so they take the palm branches and the cloaks and they put them on the ground, a political and royal gesture welcoming him as king. And Joe, you had a great job. You did good. You said that they waved their branches as they sang. They laid their garments down so royal feet would never meet the dusty, dirty ground. That was good. That's what they did. They, they honored Jesus with their cloaks, with their, their branches. They recognized him. And Anna said it, and, and I think the whole preschool said it together. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the king. Hosanna in the highest. They praised Jesus. They said, this is the king. We'll praise him. And so we'll, we'll get more into this. But the, so Jesus goes into town, verse 10. He enters Jerusalem, and the whole city was stirred and asked this question. Who is this? Verse 11, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Can you imagine being there, being on that ship? As Jesus walked by, as Jesus rode by on the colt, and as everybody crowded in and, and pressed around to see what was going on. If you were a local, I can imagine the scene. You're, you're there and, and, and you see Jesus and you've seen him before. You've heard him teach. And there are the outsiders, those who are from a long distance who've never met him before. And they're crowded in close. They, well, which one's Jesus? Well, it's, it's him. That's Jesus there on the, on the donkey. Was it true? Did he raise Lazarus from the dead? It is. I saw him just the other day. It is true. Hey, I can't believe that. That's impossible. No one comes back from the dead, especially if they've been dead for a couple days. No, I don't believe it. Oh, I saw him. I could show you the tomb. It's true. And so Jesus is starting this, this commotion in the city. The NIV uses the word, it stirred Jerusalem. That's verse, uh, verse 10. The whole city was stirred. That word stir, that Greek word there, that's the same word that the, the Greek is translated as the word earthquake. I don't think an earthquake is so much of a stirring. This is a mob. This is a big to-do. I think it would be similar to this. This is the Pittsburgh Steelers after they won the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 43, they beat the Arizona Cardinals. We're, we're at a football slide. I think you're on the wrong one. Uh, this was after uh, February 1st, 2009. And uh, there was a lot to do. They, they beat the Cardinals. And, and, and this was what it was. Now, I wasn't there, okay? At this point in my life, I was in Chicagoland, and I was rooting for the blue and orange, okay? So I apologize. I've seen the light, and I've switched over. Okay. 
But this is, this is, I think this would be close for us to understanding what it was like when Jesus came in. Everybody's there. Everybody's celebrating. Everybody's praising. Uh, it's a different praise. But if you notice, I think this is different also. What are they riding? Are they riding donkeys? No. They're riding Corvettes. And how close are the people? Well, they're as close as the security guards will let them get. That's quite a bit different. Jesus is coming into town. He's stirring up everybody's attention, stirring up quite a, a ruckus. People want to know who he is. Is he who he said he is? Is he really the Son of God? We've got to get to him. We've got to find out who he is. And so Jesus enters Jerusalem. He came in on a donkey. He left with a cross. He comes in with all the praise. He leaves a week later with a cross. Their attention doesn't last very long. He came in and, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, Hosanna to the king. See, Hosanna is a Hebrew exclamation for praise. They were praising the king. They were excited about Jesus. They were thrilled. But it's because they wanted him to be their king. The people praised their king. They didn't praise him for being the king of kings. They praised him for being the king that they wanted. See, the people wanted a political king that would save them from the Romans, that would set up shop, beat up all the Romans, stop the persecution, no more suffering. The Jews will now be in power. Everything will be good. Life will be better. That's not what Jesus was looking for. He came in to set up an earthly, a heavenly kingdom. That was far greater than any geographical area, far greater than any people group. That's why it only lasted for a week. Their praises turned into cursing. And they wanted his life to be taken from him. And so the kids did a great job portraying this. As, as Jesus was getting ready to eat his last meal with his disciples, Eden, you shared with us that Jesus and his friends assembled in the upper room, gathering there to celebrate and eat. And in faith, you shared that, that lovingly they listened as he spoke in the ancient prayers. And they watched as Jesus thanked the Lord above. That was your line. You did good with that. And then Carly, this was one of the toughest ones that he tenderly explained that the bread and the cup were symbols of his sacrifice and love. And the disciples sat there and said, what does that mean? What does it mean that you're going to sacrifice your life for us? We still don't get it. And they struggled with it on that night. Well, later we'd find out that he would lose his life. And then, Carly, again, you shared that the, uh, the angel hovered by the tomb, and the stone was rolled away. And, and the, through our fear and trembling, we heard the angel say, Dakota, you, this was yours. You did a good job, Dakota. He's not here. He is not here. The Savior lives today. That's the best news we've heard in a long time, buddy, that, that Jesus isn't in the tomb anymore. He's alive. He's back to life, and he offers salvation. And then Sadie, you said, our Lord has risen from the grave. And all of you together said, give thanks to God today. Give thanks to God. Praise God today because Jesus came back to life. Because he beat sin. He beat death. He freed us from that. He brought about salvation to mankind. That was his kingdom that he was establishing. That was why he rode into Jerusalem. Not to set up an earthly kingdom, but to bring about salvation to the world. And so we, we, we have to make a decision today. We have to make a decision of what we're going to do about Jesus. Because we could sit here and say, okay, so some guy named Jesus... A bunch of years ago, got in a donkey, rode into a town, people cheered, he lost his life, uh, and there's a rumor that he came back to life. So what? What's the big deal? I'm here to tell you, that's the biggest deal this world has ever seen. That's the most important thing you will ever wrestle with in your life is what you do with Jesus Christ. The question, I've, I've asked it a couple of times, who is this? Who is Jesus? That's the most important question you will have to answer in this life. Verse 10, when the people in the city is stirred, they ask that question. They say, who is this? Who is this Jesus that's causing all this commotion? Who is this guy? Who is he to you? Is he just some, some good moral teacher, says nice things, kind of a benefit? Like I'll take some multivitamins, I'll take some, some exercise, and I'll take a little bit of Jesus and just it'll make my life better. Or is he more than that? Is he the Lord of our life? 
See, I like what C.S. Lewis writes. C.S. Lewis says, there's three options. Jesus is either, he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. So you got three choices. The first two are pretty offensive. I'm, I'm going with the last one. But think about it. I mean, Jesus can't just be a moral teacher, a good moral teacher, because anyone who claims to be the son of God, anyone who claims to be without sin, to claim to be the atoning sacrifice for our lives, to claim to forgive sin, to go, claim to, to be salvation for us, that's more than a moral teacher. Those are bold claims. So you better have something to back that up. And so, so let's look at these, these ideas. Was Jesus a liar? If Jesus was a liar, then his claims were false and he knew it. And he just was okay with that. I don't buy this. I don't buy this at all. Jesus wasn't a liar. But if you think about this, it, it doesn't make sense. If, if a, a good moral teacher, Jesus, that's it. He's just a good moral teacher, was a compulsive liar and, and, and went around deceiving people into uh, good moral choices by lying about who he was. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and most of the liars that I know, when it comes, push comes to shove, they, they drop the lie. But Jesus held to the truth all the way up to the cross. That's truth. He was, he is the son of God. So I can't accept that he was a liar. Well, maybe he was a lunatic. Maybe he, he truly believed. Maybe his claims were false, but he, he just didn't know it. So he, he truly believed falsely that he was the son of God. I, I don't believe that either. I don't see that either. Because as, as I look at his life and I see the, the historical accounts of the, the gospels, the historical accounts of his life, and I see the miracles, how do you do that? How do you bring Lazarus back to dead? How do you heal people's sight? The miracles prove that Jesus is who he says he is. And the one above all the rest, the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, proves it. It absolutely proves it without a shadow of doubt. Jesus dies, he's in the grave for three days, and he comes back to life. He's dead, he comes back to life. He is the Son of God. And because he's proved it with his life, then there's only one option left, and that's the Lord. He is Lord. And if he's Lord, then his claims were true, and he is the Messiah. He is the king. And the kingdom that he sets up, his heavenly kingdom here, is one that we get the opportunity to serve him. And so we have an opportunity to follow him and, and, and worship him daily. I love how the kids were worshiping him up here in song. But when we say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life, you're the master, the king that I praise, it's more than just Sunday. It's every day that we get to worship him, every day that we get to follow him, every day that we get to serve him. And so I have to ask this question to you today. Who is Jesus? How do you answer that? Oh, he's a nice guy, and we'll, we'll take a little bit of Jesus every once in a while. Oh, he's He's crazy. Or he's the Lord of my life, and I follow him every day. That's my answer. And, I, and, I, and I, I hope, I pray that that is your answer. See, time is, time is limited with this choice. And time is, time is fleeting. And once we're out of time, who is Jesus is going to be the most important question you will have ever answered. And so my prayer is that you don't miss this opportunity today. I'll just tell you a quick story. How many of you know what one of these is? This is a, an easy pass. It's a little transponder. You got one of those in your car? I have, I have one of those. I, I don't have an easy pass. I have an I pass from Illinois because it's pretty cool. They work. You can go through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, PA, and, and it'll just zoom you right through in the speed zone. So it's, I like the I pass. Um, and so one day I was out riding my bike, having fun, being a responsible young man. And uh, I hopped on 76, the turnpike. And um, I pulled up to the booth, and I looked out my window, and there's the push button and receive ticket. I'm pushing the button, and nothing's happening. No tickets are coming out, nothing's happening. And then the green light goes, thank you. And the arm comes up. I think, oh, maybe it read my iPass. I just gotten a new windshield in my car. I had not yet 
mounted the iPass on the windshield. So I thought, it's probably in here somewhere. It read it. I'll just go. So I take off and I start driving. And I'm cruising down the highway and I think maybe I should try to find it so that when I get to the end, I'll be able to, you know, get off the highway. So I'm looking for my iPass while I'm driving down the road, which is not safe. And I can't find it anywhere. I can't find it anywhere. So I drive the 10 miles on 76, get to where I'm going to US 22, 57 there. And, uh, and I'm getting up there and I think, look, I don't have my iPass. I'm not going to go through the iPass easy pass lane. I'm going to go to the ticket window. So I go to the ticket window and I open up the window and I get ready to explain to this guy what happened. So I rolled the window down and I said, hey, blah, 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 all this stuff. And he goes, all right, not a problem. You don't have a ticket, so I'm going to have to charge you the no ticket fee, which is $32.40. I thought, what? $32.40 for 10 miles? you got to be kidding me. That's a lot of money, and my wife is going to beat me. This is not a good choice. Like, please, I'm, I'm begging him. I'm telling him all these stories. My iPads, I'm, I'm frantically looking. People behind me are honking. Get out of the way. I'm like, just hold on. I can't find it anywhere. He looks at me. He's like, look, it's $32.40. Pay the money. So I pay the guy the money. He sends me a slip. says, you can call these people and see if you can get your money back. Great. Okay. Get to go through a bunch of government phone. Hold, please. 45 minutes. Thank you. So long story short, I finally get a hold of somebody at Systems Audit, tell the whole thing. They give me my money back. But this is the part that really kicked me. I get home, and I'm incredibly embarrassed because I'm not really looking forward to telling my wife that I wasted 10 miles at 32 bucks on the highway. That was not going to be good. She's not going to be happy. I get home. I park the car, and, and the thought in my mind goes, where's your iPass? So I start looking. I lift up the console, and it's right there. I think, really? you got to be kidding me. Like six inches from my hip is my iPass, like right there. I could just hold that out the window, drive through, and been totally okay. And I missed it. Six inches from me, and I missed it. The solution to my problem was this close, and I missed it. Catch this, church. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, there's a problem. If you don't know him as the Lord of your life, there's a problem. When we're done here on this earth, you, I'm sorry. It's a nice, happy day. We talk about the kids and we sing and smile. But if you don't know Christ, when you leave this earth, the truth is you will be separated from God for eternity. Separated from him. All goodness is gone. There's no mulligans, no do-overs, no last-second repentance. Once it's done, it's done. And the answer, the solution is right here. It's six inches away from you. It's right here. Please don't miss this. This Wednesday, Tuesday, we were at a, a minister's meeting, and the Christian church ministers and I were sitting around and we're talking about this because, because hell is being erased from churches quickly. Oh, that's not true. Jesus would never do that. Really? Why does it talk about it in here? And, and, and we talked about it, and we said, uh, I understand the, 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 the punishment and the weeping and the, and the anguish, and I understand that. But I asked this question, I said, if in hell, is there an opportunity for, for people to know that they were this close to getting out, but they pass on it? Would there be a conscious notion that, 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 that I'm here, but I could have been there? That, in my opinion, would just frustrate me to no end. Like the punishment would be one thing, but then knowing that you were this close to the solution... And you said, no thanks to Jesus Christ. That would burn me up. Man, that's a horrible pun on words, but listen, church, today, Jesus Christ offers the gift of salvation. The question is, who is Jesus? My heart breaks if you've not answered that question. Please, today, it's this close. The solution is right here. Say yes to Jesus Christ. Say yes, I'm following him as the Lord of my life. He is the Lord. I follow him. I worship him. Let me pray. God, I pray that you will help us to, to put our faith in you. I pray that you will help us to, to follow you every day of our life. 
And God, I pray that you help us to be brave to share this with our friends, the fact that, that there's, there's, there's eternity spent with you. It's only six inches away. We love you so much, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.